Okay. Hmm. And we're back. We're here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Learning Space. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Nicole Gallucci, a postdoc with CosmoQuest Project. And I have my co-host, who is right through this wall. <laughs> Stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> Quiet down over there. <laughs> Hello. It's been a long time, it seems like, for me, actually. It has been a long time, yeah. Georgia, yeah. Um, first of all, I got I to gotta st- get this out. Um, yeah. just found out on Twitter about the death of John Dobson. Uh, creator of the Dobsonian Telescope. Uh, if uh, if you're not familiar with such a telescope, it is a a really super simple, cheap mount that allows you to use a really really big telescope. Um, so uh, John Dobson, I just saw on Twitter that he died today, and and literally the Wikipedia page was just uh, was just updated. Um, so he lived to be 98, uh, and he. Um, was the he, he he started off this idea I don't know if he's the first just I think he probably is the first guy to start off this idea of sidewalk astronomy of bringing mm-hmm. uh, an amateur telescope out on the sidewalk to talk to people get catch them as they're going by and and uh, get them to look through the telescope and see something yeah. cool yeah when I think of bringing astronomy to the people that's who I think of I think of John Dobson and I remember. I'd heard of him because of his telescope design for a long time, but um, back in the 80s, I think, PBS did a series called The Astronomers, and he was in one of the episodes, and I just remember watching, was showing him and his telescope, he was on the sidewalk, and they were looking at the moon, and and a woman came up and, you know, asked, what are you looking at? And um, she said, um, or he said, you know, this is the moon, and she said, oh, is this part of a study that you're doing? And he looked at her and he said, no, this is part of a study that you're doing. If you come up and you take a look at the moon, it's your moon. And I just thought that was so cool, oh, and I gosh. always remember that, because it's, you know, it's all, it's our sky up there, it's our moon, and we should be, we should all be out there looking and studying it. So, yeah, he is amazing, really inspirational. Mm-hmm. Um, I it's funny you say our moon. I have a pile of Astro swag on my desk right now, and there's totally a sticker that says it's our moon. Oh, I know That's from NLSI. Yeah, International Observe the Moon Night. It's all yeah, it's our yeah. moon. So um, that's a great scene. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, hear a lot about him now. What's that? Oh, I just say I will hear a lot about him now that um, he's passed on. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Thank you, John Dobson, for the sidewalk astronomy. Yeah. For the awesome telescope mount, um, I I did we did have a we had a really cool dob uh, dob is shorthand right or light bucket um, when I was an undergrad at Lycoming College in Pennsylvania mm. that we uh, took out to the side I didn't know that he did this sidewalk astronomy thing at the time I was an undergrad I didn't know anything um, not that all undergrads are but I was pretty stupid. <laughs> Uh, so we actually mm-hmm. brought this Dobsonian to the sidewalk outside the academic center at Lake Homing, and uh, it was when Mars had its closest approach, and its real closest approach, not the the uh, nonsense email that goes out every August. Your, your colossal <laughs> closest approach, right? Yeah, well, big as the moon, blah, blah, blah. No, but it was actually pretty cool to see through <laughs> this, I forget how many inch mirror that, uh, gosh, that Dr. Fisher brought out. Um, and uh, we had several hundred people come by, and this was like one of my first outreach experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, the sidewalk and the daub together is pretty cool. Yeah. So. And so, it's yeah. the kind of telescope you could make if you were going to make a telescope. Because I always thought, oh, one of these days, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grind the mirror. I'm going to get the huge tube and make a Dobbs. And, you know, I never have. Yeah. But, you know. Um, we should do that together because I want to do the mirror grinding yeah. thing. <laughs> because yeah. that. Do that. Yeah. yeah. I've been it's told that, that that's I've a very, that. it's a very, I don't want to use the word spiritual. It's a very <laughs> <laughs> kind of zen, you kind of get into Experience. it. And yeah. it's almost meditative. Yeah, that's what that's I've it. heard. That's it. All right, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna make the really skills. frustrating part where you you know are like a degree yeah. off or something. Yeah, we could do uh, it. We should totally do it. That'll be like a whole series of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> One episode, just a clip show. I know, it's like you could update your progress. Ah, oh, this yeah. week, what's yeah. the dog doing now? What's the dog? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's. Um, so okay, so I wanted to talk about that. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul Stewart was on Twitter. Was the first one who I saw. One of our virtual star party peeps, um, who was the first tweet that I happened to see. But uh, go check out the hashtag John Dobson on Twitter right now. People are talking about their experiences with the telescope and sidewalk astronomy and about the man himself. 
Um, so yeah, sad news to, to start the show with. Uh, yeah, like you said, we haven't been around for a while. Um, I want to remind you guys of the ways you can contact us. You can share the link. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I turned the Q&A up <laughs> on this time correctly, so uh, you can use the Q&A app. I think there's comments on the event page, and there's comments on the YouTube, okay. the YouTubes, the Facebooks, and the face pages. Um, so I will try and keep an eye on those as well, but probably the Q&A app's the one that I see the most because it's actually on the video screen. One of these days I'll figure, I'll figure out how to get these all yeah, together. Yeah, then you can show me how it all works. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> so and then we'll change it. And I'm waiting for Nicole to figure it out, and then you come over and tell me what to do. I will be, I will be redoing <laughs> my... my, my uh, hang out tutorial soon, so I'll put that Yeah, up. okay. Be waiting. Uh, so yeah, so comment, leave a question, say hello, do all the usual. Um, we did have a brief show last week. Uh, if you missed it, it wasn't at the regular time. It was it was kind of a guerrilla action. <laughs> uh, I got together with, so I was part of the second astronomy ambassadors workshop um, yeah. that the uh, American Astronomical Society has put on with the astro. Astronomical Society of the Pacific, so AAS and ASP, those of you who know your acronyms. Um, it was the second year they did this workshop, training young astronomers, uh, students, grad, you know, undergrads, grad students, I think it was mostly grad students, postdocs, yeah, and grads. young professional astronomers to do outreach. Um, and it was a really cool program, and I got together with some of uh, my new cohort and some people from last year, the first cohort, and we talked about the program and the cool stuff that uh, people have been doing over the last year, who did it last year. Uh, so check that out. That was last week's. It was only about a half hour, and it was in a somewhat echoey ballroom. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you will be seeing more of those people, because I told them I'm going to tap them from learning space from here on in, because uh, they are all great outreach people. Um yeah, and then I pro I told you guys I was going to do some videos to keep it going through Christmas and New Year's, and then I got really sick, so that didn't happen. Sorry. Uh, so I, I hope you better can. now. I'm better now. Recovered. Yeah. Recovered. Yeah, I know a lot of people in the U.S. have had the flu. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. So. I've avoided it, so fingers crossed, yes. Mm, gay flu shots. <laughs> gay flu shots. All right, so what we wanted to talk about, uh, speaking of sidewalk astronomy, something you can do uh, on the sidewalk really easily is point out constellations. We want to talk some about our favorite constellations and about our favorite constellation stories, uh, as well as the um, so what, what prompted this is we got an inflatable planetarium from Star, uh, Star Lab uh, in the STEM Center here where we work, so we wanted to... Uh, tell you a little bit about that um, and uh, I don't know if you want to That is awesome. With... What's that? Because that is awesome. Yeah, let's start. Let me show you a picture. Um, if you haven't seen yeah. one of these before, it is this big inflatable dome. <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to put it. Dome. Um, that you can, uh, it, it's like a tent times I was going to say, like going camping only yes. inside and more fun in a way. This is a fantastic yeah. picture of our outreach coordinator, Sean Herberts. <laughs> that looks not, like the blob there. I'm not sorry for showing yes. this. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, we took it on a trial run for the Teen Science, uh, Gateway Teen Science Cafe um, back in um, October. And we had a bunch of high school students who were coming for a talk to. Um, to, uh, yeah, the talk was about the moon and Cosmic West and Citizen Science, which had nothing to do with constellations, but uh, we wanted to set it up and, and show them the constellations anyway. So we did that. Uh, I don't have any interesting pictures of inside because it's very, I don't have a nice camera to do inside pictures. But but. Can you show, so show how, you know, where you would go into this big thing. Oh, this, that, that would be, you got it. So we have, we have the older version. We have the older version. I don't know if you can see this tube here. <laughs> You crawl into the tube. It actually opens up. And yeah. then it crawl, and then it opens up and you can stand inside. Um, there's no floor necessarily because there's a big fan that keeps it inflated. Uh, and uh, you get everyone to kind of sit around. And then you have a little movable um, stand inside. I love this picture of Sean. A little movable stand inside behind where Sean is, is holding his hands up, um, which uh, has a projector. And the projector is, is uh, in this case, we got the analog projector, I'll call it. Um, it is a uh, has a series of cylinders. It has a series of cylinders, essentially with little holes. It's op opaque with little holes in it 
that uh, indicate where the stars are. And it's got a really bright LED that goes in the middle and it projects onto the inside of this dome. So we have the analog version. We ordered some cylinders. Uh, we ordered, uh, I think, Northern Sky. So, I don't know. Somebody put me in charge of ordering cylinders because <laughs> why would they do that? <laughs> I had a blast. So we got like Northern Sky, Southern Sky. Then we got Greek constellations, Native American constellations. Mm -hmm. We got a special Lewis and Clark cylinder, which uh, has a lot of stuff about astronavigation. And I forgot what the sixth one was <laughs> already, because <laughs> we haven't oh, we yeah. haven't opened it since the move. Um, so yeah, you can, and you can get all these little cylinders. Now a lot of so this is this is kind of the older analog version. Um, you know, it's like pinpoints in 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 the film to get you your stars. Um, but they also make these really swanky digital projectors. Uh, and the, the dome that goes with that is uh, you can actually go in walking. Um, and with the digital projector, you can really go to town showing uh, you know, movies that have been rendered for a, a planetarium screen. Um, for example, we have Cosmic Castaways with CosmoQuest and Science on the Half Sphere, which is a, an open source 20 minute long planetarium movie. So if you have one of these digital projectors, you can just go download the movie it's huge. <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> file. You go download the movie and uh, and actually show that in your planetarium. Yeah. Ruins your night vision though, I bet. Oh, it does ruin your night vision. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you're gonna show show a fun movie. Um, but but yeah, it's still it's very cool. It's a very different experience. Um, so even the one you guys, so the one the STEM Center has is huge. Um, it's the large, because there was like a regular size, right? Yeah. And then the we just went all out. Size. Yeah, and how many Adults, can you fit in? Do you remember? Oh, I remember. I saw the number what? on the website, and I laughed at it because <laughs> I would never try and put that many people in there. <laughs> but that's just me because I am me. I mean, I want to say more than fifty. It right? was more than fifty, and and I think you could get away with it with adults, especially if they don't mind being a little cozy. Um, with younger audiences, it's a bit more difficult to keep them controlled and quiet. <laughs> Especially me, because I have a tendency to ask questions and expect them to shout out answers, and then you can't get them to stop talking. So, <laughs> so I, I shoot myself in the foot there. But um, I'm trying to find the dome size. Um, yeah, so for that reason alone, I mean, it's nice to keep the numbers small. It's nice, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with about 30 even in the large dome. Here we go. Classic giant dome. The diameter is 22 feet. Uh, the height's 13.5 uh, feet or 4.1 meters. Sorry, I want to use my metric for <laughs> piece. Uh, seating up to 56 people. So you can fit up to 56 people in there. Controlling okay. 56 people in the dark is a very different story. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Ooh. Oh, we have an excellent comment from Tom Nath. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it Nath or Nath. Yell at me at some point <laughs> to pronounce your name properly. Um, you need to uh, try out Microsoft's Worldwide Telescope for use in the planetarium. I'm a big fan of Worldwide Telescope. Um, partly because Microsoft let us uh, host in dot astronomy this past year and we all got to play with it. Uh, Worldwide Telescope is uh, can do movies and planetarium software and I think it's all free. Um, you can make uh, all kinds of amazing stuff, and I think you can render it for 3D for a planetarium as well. Um, so go check out Worldwide Telescope. You do need to have Windows to run the... You can, you can run it on any machine. You can run the shows on any machine. But if you want to create things, you have to install Windows. And so a whole bunch of astronomers installed Windows on their Macs just to use Worldwide Telescope. That's how cool this thing is. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Tom. That is definitely something to check out. But you could um, take, I have, I've never tried this, but I think you could take a little uh, projector and a mm -hmm. um, laptop into mm -hmm. the dome, and you could still probably show quite a few interesting things. I you know, think you could still show... I wanted to do that, yeah. It's large enough that I think you could use a regular projector without too much warping. Yeah, um, so I haven't tried it. But, but even the, with the, the cylinder, like you say, it's the analog version, but um, from what I remember, and I haven't seen this one, but when I used it years and years ago, mm -hmm. it still was really impressive. I mean, it still showed, you know, wonderful star fields um, that really, I mean, it gets oohs and ahs yeah. from the kids, you know, when you dim the lights and they start to see stars. I mean, it's just like when you're outside and you're waiting for your eyes to get used to the darkness and, and you see that first, that second star. And it's like, ooh, you know, and then suddenly, wow, you know, I see tons of yeah. stars. So it's yeah. still so impressive. I actually, when we, um, so we, we did it for the Teen Science Cafe 
And it was the first time I had been and used one in a while, and I stepped in and turned it on to set up, and I looked up, I was like, oh what? my god, I don't know what anything is. Like, <laughs> I figured this would be easy, because I do, I, do, um, I do the public nights here every two weeks. I'm like, I know what's in the sky. Didn't, no, just totally not used to not, like, polluted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, it was it was pretty intense, and I you know yeah, I it is. It's actually enough. easier in a way in the semi-polluted or you know very polluted real sky to find some things yeah. because you know there's not as much to get in the way. <laughs> you know? yeah. there's fewer stars that you have to worry about looking at, um, and it's pretty intense in the dome with you know all of them there mm -hmm. and no atmosphere in the way. Really. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> oh yeah! It just gets noisy. That's my only thing with it is because it's a sphere. <laughs> yes, there's you some reflection. echo properties and yeah that you hear. Mm -hmm. And um, students across the dome think they're whispering and you can't hear them, but quite often you can. Oh yeah. And they're very surprised about that. <laughs> so uh, Star Lab's not the only company that makes them like these. Yeah. Uh, Digitarium's another one. I think they were just at the American Astronomical Society conference with their big dome showing it off to the astronomers. Yeah. Um, there are lots of other companies. And, and like I said, it's really great because uh, building a permanent planetarium is a super expensive project if you want to do outreach. Um, especially if you, because this you can bring to schools. It's just so cool yeah. um, to, uh, to do that. So uh, Tom says, all vowels long. Now I don't know if that's Nath or Nathy. Mm -hmm. That would be Nathy. Nathy? Okay. He's yeah, going to get if that's Nathie. right or not. <laughs> uh, my, my name is, you know. Well, yeah. Uh, ooh, a friend of mine, and he continues, a friend of mine just updated a community college's 60s era dome. I went to a college with a 60s era planetarium. Uh, to, they just updated their projector to worldwide telescope. Costs about 40k for projectors, computer, and lenses, mm -hmm. and the software itself is free. So, yeah, you can upgrade. That's a pretty cheap price to upgrade a, a mm -hmm. permanent planetarium, I think. Um, that, that's a pretty good price. So, But I, li I like, you know, again, if you can't afford a permanent one, this one you can take to schools, you can travel with, you can uh, take to campuses. Um, we used it uh, when I was with Dark Skies Bright Kids, uh, to, especially to make up for, like, if we tried to schedule a family observing night and we had a cloudy night, we kind of... Uh, <laughs> so your university had one, UVA had it? A UVA or... eventually got one. We used to borrow one so from the, chil the Children's Museum in Charlottesville. We used to oh. partner with them. And then we got money for our own uh, from I think the Chandra outreach grant, and oh, right. uh, we got the digital. We went all out. We got the digital one. Yeah. And then and then not me, but several of my several of my colleagues uh, like hacked the software because they didn't like the traditional shows that it came with, and they wanted to make their own shows. So they hacked them with, with, with our own. permission from uh, the software people. They were like, "Oh yeah, that's cool. Here, here's our files." Do stuff. That's, <laughs> and, uh, that's very they, cool. they hacked it and made some of their own. are typical teachers, you know. You've you got all the stuff you can buy, but then teachers always want to do their own thing. We want to do more stuff, so, yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, because these things aren't cheap either, um, but sure. often you can find somebody that will uh, you can borrow them from, you can rent them from. Mm -hmm. um, when I was teaching years and years ago, you know, our little district could never afford to get one, but we had a local um, office of education that had one, and with some training, the teachers could go get trained, and then you know you put a little deposit down, but you take good care of it, and you can have it for a week at your school, take all your students through it, and then you know return, and and it was really amazing. Nice. Kids loved it. Yeah, we um that's that's something we're in, in the well I say we really Colin, who was a previous guest on the show, uh is is uh, working out for this for our free resource center here. So if you're in Southern Illinois, uh, the STEM resource STEM resource center at SIUE uh, will have it available. Um, I don't know what we're doing about training yet in terms of training people to use it. Uh, we will have it available for a fee because it will come with a person to run it, and it'll be to pay that person to run it. Um, but they haven't set that yet, so hopefully it'll be uh, nice and affordable for, <laughs> for, for <laughs> school groups and educators and stuff. Um, you know, so that that that's in the works here at least. So I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, I know. Um, so so that so that is the the inflatable the world of inflatable planetaria. So we'll <laughs> dip into that, uh, and that got me thinking of uh, get us thinking about uh, constellation stories. Um, oh, sorry. One more thing. A couple more things. I've just seen the the uh, comments here. Um, Guido Vibra says uh, from earlier, very sad about John Dobson. Um, 
and uh, Daniel Barringer is very excited about Star Lab. I nearly lost my voice many times with kids in Star Lab. It's amazing how loud Tiny Lungs can be. That. <laughs> that yes. is exactly it. Tiny Lungs yeah, and Reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, definitely, it's definitely not affordable for everybody, Guido Bieber points out, uh, but still fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the kind of thing, if, if you're an organization and can write a, a grant, um, I guess small to mid-sized grant, depending on, on the size of your organization, uh, that this will get you one of these, and it's really fun. So, yeah. so yes, yeah, so we were talking. Uh, so that got me thinking about constellations because on the website, on the Star Lab website, they have, uh, especially since the the stick, the particular stick figures they use on the constellation cylinders, I don't always recognize, <laughs> and so they have They're those pictures. Right? Oh my god! 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 Wait, wait a minute. Okay. Wait, nope. wait. Oh, where's the author? Okay, I love this thing. Yeah, this is yeah. Ooh, oh, yeah. there we go. H. A. Ray. H. A. Ray, the stars. Okay. Curious George guy. Okay. Harkening back I to learned, our. I learned episode. the star const. I learned the constellations with this book. Yeah. Before, long before I ever knew what a star lab was, and I was amazed and delighted to find out that yeah, this is at least on one of the domes. One of the domes, one of the cylinders we're talking about shows the constellations drawn out the way he did. So, yes, it's a little different than some people yeah. learn them. You're but right. I, it is the ray. Sil you're right. It is the ray constellation I know, cylinder. It's um, but you know, there's another cylinder I think that shows them in a more traditional way. Now I don't know. The if artistic that's drawings. More. Artistic. Okay. Yes. This yeah. is Where more artistic. Greek figures and they're very pretty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these are more supposed to look like what the constellation is supposed to be. Yeah, it's like if you actually connect the stars. Right. But it's not. So, it, yeah, most yeah. of the time, it is. It's a really good. It's a really good way. And this book is still around. The stars. So, it's still an awesome book. Is it on Amazon? We, it's on Amazon. Have a wave of people going to Amazon. It's like, <laughs> and it's like under twenty dollars. I don't. Nice. I last time I looked, it was like twelve or thirteen dollars. So. Yeah, it's well worth it. Um, and if you're whether you're trying to learn constellations to go into the Star Lab or learn them just for the real sky, um, it's a great way to learn. Do so you have a, a favorite? Very user you friendly. Do you have a favorite that you want to start with? <sighs> um, mm. or maybe what was your favorite as a kid? You know, I really loved. I always liked the Pleiades. I don't yeah. know why. Um, I guess because it's pretty. One of these, and it's one of those that somehow it just catches your eye when you're out there looking, and you may not even know what it is, but it's this little glimmery group of stars. And then, of course, it looks fantastic in a, a binoculars or a telescope, but even naked eye, it's just a really amazing group of stars. And um, I'm sad to say I don't really know a good version of the story. Um, mm -hmm. I know there is a story that goes with it, but of course it's also called the Seven Sisters. Um, and I know you can get, there's lots of versions of the story out there, um, but it is one that we did share with the kids because they could, they could find it in the real sky too. And what we tried to do was show them the constellations in the Star Lab and then help them to find them in the real sky. And actually, most of them were very successful in finding. Because you teach them the tricks of how to kind of yeah. star hop and go from constellation to constellation. And they did a pretty good job. And that was fifth graders that I had, 10-year-olds. Ten year, ten so um, I like, I don't know, I like, I love the Pleiades, I think, just because of the way it looks. I think there are probably better and more exciting stories out there about constellations. But... Um, well, the, the Pleiades is, is a good object to look at because um, it, it the fuzziness is just at the edge of our vision for most yeah. of us. Um, and so it's the fact that it's, it's, it's an object, but it's not a point, it's not a star, it's something else. Um, so yeah, that, that's why it's really cool. It, it is, of course, a, 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 a very loose open star cluster of young stars. Um, yeah, and you know, and I, well, and you asked me what my favorite constellation was, and it's not. Oh really yeah, constellation. That's so all right. That's fine. You answer that question very well. Sorry. It's your um, favorite thing in the sky. It's fine. <laughs> Mine's Cygnus A, which is a radio galaxy. But you so know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So we talk a lot about the constellations and how they came to be, and there's official constellations now, of course. But um, mm -hmm. way back, and even now, people go out and they they make up their own shapes. And different cultures, of course, have different shapes and stories with the constellations. And um, 
the Pleiades is actually one that I've heard called a, a little shopping cart, which I always thought was really cute. Um, or, or a little, a very little dipper. It does have a dipper shape. Mm -hmm. um, but shopping cart, I don't know why, I always liked. And the kids got right onto that. They said, yeah, I saw yeah. the shopping cart. Um, because they like to hear the alternate, you know. It's way something that we, yeah, the we think Because then they start to make up their own. And, you know, it's not the official name, but it's still okay because it gives them a good way to connect to the sky and it gives them a nice way to remember, you know, the stars that are out there and get them to go out and look. Um, so, so you can, you know, you can draw a shape and that's what the constellations are all about. Shapes and stories. Yeah. Finding your so, way around in the sky. Uh, we have a comment from Michael Rector who uh, also pointed out that, as a kid I thought the Pleiades was the Little Dipper. Good thing I never had to use it to guide myself north. <laughs> <laughs> I, that happens all the time, especially when you show up binoculars, because it's like, oh, it's a little dipper. It's like, it's no, a, it's kind of uh, like the itty bitty dipper. <laughs> I know, the mini dipper. It'd be the mini dipper. Kind of different. Kind of different. I know. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's actually part of Taurus, isn't it? It is part of the Taurus constellation. Okay. And and the way, yeah, the other way to Taurus is awesome too. Yeah, we like Taurus. Um, to the constellations can be thought of as the groupings of stars with the pictures and the lines, but also the modern constellations have regions defined around them. So every piece yeah. of sky is broken up. I think it's 88 constellations. Yeah, every piece of that. sky is broken up, and that's used in, in, in traditional star naming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have uh, another comment from Guido saying that the first constellation I really recognized was Cassiopeia. Uh, yeah. Before that, it was oh, or before it was always the triangle over the big maple tree in summer, which I'm not sure is, is Cassiopeia or you start with the summer triangle. Um, it could be the summer triangle. I like that. The triangle over the maple tree. Yes. I totally get it. Yeah, there was yeah. there was the thing by the streetlight when I was growing up. <laughs> that really bright yeah. thing up there. What is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia. Yeah. Cassiopeia is one of my favorites. So um, I'm not going to tell the story because the, if you are listening to this in the podcast version, that means you already listened to 365 Days of Astronomy podcast, the, the audio-only version of this. Um, and you need to go back to an earlier episode. Uh, it was the uh, Heidi Winter Memorial Lecture by uh, Dr. Ed Murphy at the University of Virginia. Um, he tells the, the Cassiopeia, the story, it starts with Cassiopeia, um, mm -hmm. and it's this story that ties in a whole bunch of constellations in the same part of the sky. Uh, it's Cassiopeia, it's her husband Cepheus, their daughter Andromeda, her future husband Perseus, Perseus rides in on Pegasus the winged horse, and, um, th so this whole part of the sky, and I think Cetus the sea I monster is in there? Yeah, Cetus the whale or the sea monster is. Yes. It looks kind of whaleish, but technically I think he was a sea monster. It was like a. Um, bleh. <laughs> bleh. Uh, this is why I'm not telling the story because when I when it comes out of me, it goes. Bleh. Um, I'll give you the I'll give you the spoiler alert. Cassiopeia's vain. The yes. <laughs> the gods punish her by chaining her daughter to a rock because that's fair. Um, I like to tell the snarky feminist version of this story. That makes um, sense. Yeah. But uh, and and Perseus uh, sees her and and saves her. And Murphy tells the story in in incredibly just captivating detail um, mm -hmm. and points out it's probably one of the oldest stories, uh, the oldest current known stories in mankind. It came from not from the Greeks but from the Babylonians. Um, and so this this whole uh, story of vanity and and damsel and like this is like the first damsel in distress story. Mm -hmm. This is you know um, this is one of the first mm -hmm. recorded stories of humankind, uh, and it's 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 written up there in the constellations uh, you know in in the Greek constellations as we use them today. Um, so yeah, if if you get a chance, go check it out. Three sixty five days of astronomy. Uh, it was just a few weeks back. It was the Heidi Winter Memorial Lecture. It's an hour long talk uh, with an introduction. Um, that made me cry because it was about it was about Heidi Winter, who's a, a fascinating, amazing woman. Um, yeah. But then uh, it goes into the constellation stories, and it's really, really fun. So uh, check that. A out. A lot of these stories end up with some way or reason that the the character got put up into the sky. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all morality stories. It's all yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So she's a circumpolar constellation. Yes. Right. Yes. If you're in the northern hemisphere, you will see her most of the time. She's that W shape in the sky. Yes. 
uh, or M, <laughs> depending yep. on what mm -hmm. season it is. So, yes, so for part of the year, she is upside there down. There's, there's the W. There's the, there's the Ray W. <laughs> Melody. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, and that's, that's a pretty my favorite. Favorite. easy to find mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you have a lot of trees and she's really low to and the ground. Low. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you're if you're in the northern hemisphere, northern. And it could be that big W thing by the maple tree out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's got triangles. It totally has triangles. Well, um, and I like Cepheus. So Cepheus is nearby. Cepheus is is Cassiopeia's husband. They are the king and queen of Ethiopia. I think. Yes, that's um, right. Oh, yeah, there it is, right there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there is a variable star in Cepheus called Delta Cephei. Uh, and Ooh. it is um, a very well known variable star. And it is uh, a, uh, it's, it's visible to the naked eye. And its period is short enough that you can watch it over several nights. And the other cool thing about it, okay, so you have this variable star that's that's changing its brightness over several nights. There are two other stars right near it that make this little tiny triangle off this edge of uh, Cepheus. Um, and when it's at its dimmest, is it's dim as the one star. When it's at its brightest, it's as bright as the other star. So you have calibrators. And you could go out there every night for and, and actually, like, you know, we, we used to do this lab back at, like, home in college, um, where we would chart out the brightness of Delta Cephei over the course of a semester, rating it from like you know one to five or, or something like yeah. that, comparing it to those two stars. It's comparing. really simple. Yeah, no technology required um, way of exploring variable stars. So that's a really good laboratory exercise if you have an astronomy 101 class and get them out there to look at uh, you know to look at uh, look at the sky every night. Yeah. Uh, I should point out, Michael Rector also says, explaining Cassiopeia depends, I, I forgot, there are other orientations. It could be a W or an M, it could be an E, or it could be a 3. So, <laughs> Cassiopeia spins uh, around. It can be many things. Yeah, yeah, it can be many, many things. Many, many things. Um, do you have another story? Any other stories? Well, the, the only other one, and again, you know, not, I was never really good. I had to do a lot of practicing to try to tell these stories, so mm -hmm. I'm not really a storyteller. But um, my other favorite one was Scorpio and Orion. So there is um, a story that explains why you can never see those two constellations in the sky at the mm -hmm. same time. So at least, again, for us, Orion tends to be a winter constellation. Scorpio is a summer more easily seen in the summer. And um, I forget all the details of the story, but of course it um, you know, involves somebody doing something wrong to somebody else and being punished, and the um, Orion and Scorpion are chasing each other around the sky, and they mm -hmm. never catch up with each other, but they never stop chasing each other either. They're just always you know, at opposite ends, and uh, so you'll never see them together. They're opposite seasons in the sky, so that is, that is one. And there is much, much more to that story. But <laughs> I, remember that, I remember that point the of the story, is, too. Yes, you're right, that they are always kept apart, um, never catching up to each other in an opposite ends of the sky. So, so it kind of helps. You know, if you yeah. see Orion up, you know, don't bother to look for the scorpion, is what we always told the kids. And if you can find the scorpion, because they're both very easy relatively easy constellations to find. You know, great constellations. They look like what they're supposed to look like, right? It looks like a scorpion. The scorpion looks like a person. stars, yeah, and the scorpion. And then Orion, of course, is amazing. And, yeah, it looks, looks like a person up there. So easy to find. So if you are looking at one, you're not going to see the other one. Don't even try. And Orion, Orion uh, is a person in many different cultures, constellation stories, because it looks like a person. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things. Right. Like almost always a person. Yeah. 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 So um, it's a great hunter, great warrior, um, important person too. So yeah. Well, it's got man. all the bright stars. It's got and all the bright stars, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually looking at the at the handouts you gave me. You gave me some of the Native American constellations. Um, they have Navajo and Hopi stories uh, that come along with the Star Lab as well. I'm trying to find the one that was um, Orion. And Said, um, so the website for the, the Star Lab also has stories and things that you can yes. download, which I hadn't looked at before, but yeah. 
Oh, here we go. Long slasher, slim one is also Orion. So this is this is this is the the uh, older version of the Star Lab <laughs> <laughs> manual. <laughs> Yay! Star Lab um, version they, one point oh. They right. do have it on the website, the the modern version. Um, but yeah, that that again, they see a person with a sash because of the belt. It's just wow, yeah. Paradolia right there. There it is. Um, but he was leading. Yeah, he was again a very important person, leading his people away from enemies. Um, to a new land, and then uh, they started fighting along the way. And he's like, no, "Guys, guys, seriously, we 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 ran away from our enemies because we didn't like fighting. Why are you fighting amongst yourselves? Like, stop!" <laughs> so he was a, a good leader for Nick kicking some sense into his uh, his people. Yeah. Uh, Tom says Orion is a bit of a pinhead. <laughs> oh no, it's true though, because of the shape. It's got yeah. the it's got the star, 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 know, star, star. Like right yeah, it's like shoulders, belt, knees, and then like that's his head. <laughs> it's very good. Orion's a bit of a pinhead. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use that one. <laughs> Orion's a bit of a pinhead. These that's are awesome. also um and these are also visible. So I, I'm sure we have somebody listening from the southern hemisphere. We didn't forget you. Um, mm -hmm. Orion and and Scorpio can be seen from a lot of the southern southern hemisphere uh, locations. Yeah, definitely freaked me out when I was in South Africa and Orion was upside down. Just I know. I was going to say, I have seen them both from Australia, and yeah. Didn't know what to do with myself. Like, it's upside down. Of course it's not upside down to, to people who live there all the time, but to right. me it's no, upside down. Insane. No, good totally, totally freaked me out, but that was cool. Um, I, I have absolutely no concept of most of the Southern Constellations. I really did struggle when I was down there. Um, and a lot of them are, are more modern now. The Southern Constellations that we use are... What were they? I don't remember when they were actually. Was it 18th century that they were? Because there's telescopium and microscopium and all of these modern That's instruments. A little, like right equipment instruments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, the southern hemisphere ones are are very different. More sciency in a way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not bad. I I can I can dig it. I can dig it. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, tell a story of Orion that I heard. All right. I don't know. I, I don't know the, the origin of this, and I'm going to tell it as I heard it. And I heard it from, uh, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Kelsey Johnson, who's a professor at University of Virginia, totally awesome astronomer, um, founded the Dark Skies Bright Kids program, uh, outreach program. And I have this, I also have this on audio, uh, which I think it was a, a very old 365 podcast, um, telling the story of Orion to a group of school children. <laughs> And this is great. And again, I don't know the origin, the veracity of this story, where it came from, but um, the story goes there was an old man who uh, lived alone. He'd always wanted children, but he lived alone. He was an old man at this point, so he was never going to have children. Um, and he's a very poor old man living in his little hovel, and he doesn't have much. Uh, and these, these, uh, t this, um, this traveler comes along the road and, and is, you know, he's like, I've been traveling, I'd, I'd like a place to rest and eat. And the man says, oh, sure, please come in, come in. And uh, the man had this one skinny cow. This <laughs> one skinny <laughs> cow. It's like, it's one possession. And he's like, I really have nothing else to eat. So he slaughters, like, his one skinny cow to serve this traveler a decent meal. And, and uh um, the traveler was was so impressed by this show of hospitality that he decided to reward the man. Um, this is you. You've always wanted a son. I'm going to give you a son. And so I forgot which god. It's probably Zeus. I don't know. It was some. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot which god it was. Some god. You had that power. Him. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So he, it would, this traveler was a god in disguise. Like yeah, uh, you know, this is a fairly common story. Um, and he says, "I'm going to give you what you've always wanted. I'm going to give you a son." The way he does it, <laughs> so he goes outside to where the man has buried the remains of this skinny cow that he had. Oh, okay. And he pees on it. <laughs> the god pees on the cow carcass, and it becomes a fully grown human son for this old man. Well, that is a powerful god. So Orion, <laughs> Urine, there's some connection. Again, I have no idea oh, <laughs> the origin no. of the story. That's the connection? Okay. But this is how I heard it told uh, to a bunch of school children. It, 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 it may just be because it was it was hilarious to tell to the school children. Uh, and, and really, I mean, let's face it, these are all, you know, people throwing, swinging bears by their tails and throwing them in the sky. Mm -hmm. These are fictional stories. You can just 
kind of roll with it and make up stories along the way, whether or not this is actually an ancient story, if this is something that uh, morphed out of later storytelling. Yeah, is, is okay. Unhealthy. That's what stories do. Um, they grow and change, which is awesome. And um, you know, the kids that heard that story, like you, are never going to forget that. Right. <laughs> and it was funny because the volunteers, we had, a lot of us hadn't heard that version either. We were just like, <laughs> we were just as shocked as really? the kids. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, excellent. So that's that's my Orion story. I don't yeah. tell that one at the star parties. I need to research a little bit more before I actually tell. Oh, but, well, yeah. but that's fun, and so that's another activity that kids can do, is they can oh, make yeah. up their own stories to go with either the constellations that they're learning, or um, we used to give them just blank star field maps, just yep. Xerox them, and then they trace, you know, make up your own shapes, whatever you want, and then, you know, make up your story. So is it going to be a, a hero story? Is it going to be just a weird animal story? Um, what is it going to be? An adventure story? And you know, anything futuristic, you know, we had robots. I mean, it was it was really fun. And they make up their own stories. Yeah. Because that's what people have been doing throughout, you know, history, throughout the ages when they look yeah. up. And they see the stars and they look at, and they see, the, oh, there's shapes and there's weird things up there. And, and now, you know, these weird things have to do other things and let's make up a whole story and it's entertaining and it's educational and yeah. it's great. We, uh, I did a version of that, uh, letting kids make up their own constellation oh, yeah. stories. Uh, again, this was somebody at DSPK came up with this or found it online. Uh, we got black construction paper, and we would just hole punch the heck out of it randomly. Oh, yeah. Now, this takes yeah. a lot of prep, so you have to have a lot of really procrastinating grad students <laughs> to get to pull this off for a large group. It's a small group, you can do it. Um, so you get these, these little, this, so they get these, black construction paper with the holes punched in them and they're told that's your star fields. Come up with a story. Yeah. We had, oh god, we had Perry the Platypus, <laughs> which you guys may know from Phineas and Ferb. Uh, <laughs> they would just pull, you know, cartoon characters. There was one, there was one very detailed picture of a person that was Bob. We have no idea who Bob is, but Bob was very important to this kid. <laughs> <laughs> they made a constellation. Uh, I've, 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 I still have one somewhere that's a sea monster. Yeah, they come up with really great stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, if you hit the right age, if they're too old and not really in the mood, they're not going to want to do it. If they're too young, they're really like, what are you doing? I'm just going to scribble on this. So. I know. So that's why I loved, I had, I think, the perfect age. When I was teaching, mm. I was teaching fifth grade and 10-year-olds, yeah. and they're like, Perfect. They just yeah. they they get into it. They're a little silly. They're having fun with it, but yet they're still you know doing it. They're on task. They're learning and yeah. just having a great time. So yeah, yeah I, I got I got little kid cred when I knew who Peter the Platypus was. <laughs> so yeah. I was very happy about that because Phoenix and Verb is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, so another good uh, constellation. Let's let's we got we got to hit this one from Tom Nathy. Now I can pronounce your name. Uh, Sagittarius. Um, is a, a very cool constellation. Uh, it is uh, the center, actually, it is, it, from our point of view on Earth, if you're looking at, at Sagittarius, you are looking uh, towards the center of our galaxy. Um, so if you are at a dark enough site, and especially if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you can see the Milky Way as a band through the sky. Um, from the, the uh, combined starlight of all the distant stars, and then the dust clouds that are in between, uh, that block some of that light, red and some of that light. Um, really gorgeous, gorgeous sight. And uh, the center of it all, which of course is obscured in dust, um, is, is in Sagittarius. And in fact, so, so point out, Sagittarius is an archer, I think. Yes. Right? Okay, because yep. to me, Sagittarius is a teapot. <laughs> and to most people, it's teapot. Yeah. Okay, it is not drawn as a teapot. In in Ray in H A Ray, this is why I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. Find that. I know because it's Sagittarius the Archer. I know it actually looks like an archer in his. So we have to make it look like an archer. Um, but but he does talk look about. Look up in the sky. It looks like a teapot. Let's yeah. Just so he talks about the teapot as an asterism. Because it's only part of the constellation. Oh. Yeah, it's a shape of stars that's not an official constellation. So. Yeah, yes. but I know he draws it. He draws it as an archer. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, an archer, though. <laughs> it's just me. I don't see that many archers. I mean, other than the TV show. 
but uh, you know, how many hydras do you see? How many? Yeah, but I mean, when there's something else to see, then I'm gonna tend like once you see the teapot, you can't unsee the teapot. I know. Oh, so this okay. is the teapot. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It hits you in the face. It's definitely a teapot. Yeah. Yeah. So this teapot. This this one even has a teaspoon. Yeah. But the, uh, <laughs> the 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 band of the Milky Way, I don't know if you can see on the screen here, this is like lighter gray going diagonally across the screen. So mm -hmm. it kind of looks like the Milky Way is like steam coming up out of the uh, out yeah, of the It actually teapot. looks better in the real sky. Yes, it does. Yeah, that, that's pretty terrible. But that's okay. No, but it's, it's, yes, it's, that's it's, exactly it's illustrative. <laughs> but yeah, it actually looks like uh, steam coming out of the teapot. That's, yeah. that's one way to, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that is a fun constellation. Uh, it's pretty far south where we are here in Illinois, um, and we have some, from my observing site, we have, uh, yeah, oil refineries. Oh, yeah, <laughs> lights too. on all the time, so it's kind of hard to see from yeah, here. Um, so if you can get a clear view of Sagittarius, and point it out and say, you know, this super massive black hole in the center of our galaxy lives right there, and it's, you know, right in that direction. Um, we can't see much going on in the optical, but if you have a radio telescope or an X-ray telescope, you can see some pretty cool stuff happening uh, at that at that uh, constellation. Yeah, awesome. Uh, okay, so we have a comment from Jeff Setzer. Last time I did a Messier marathon, which I will briefly mention what that is, I distinctly f remember feeling like it was getting warmer when summer constellations rose. It was like my brain associated warm weather with teapot. Okay, so Messier mm. marathon is... This typically happens in March. If you stay up all night in March, Northern Hemisphere again, um, you can hit every object in the Messier catalog. All uh, I think it's 100 and shoot. I don't remember. 113. <laughs> there's like the official yeah. Messier catalog, and yeah. then there's a few add-ons, so you can see all the Messier objects. Um, ooh, uh, sorry, distracted by the comments. Um, in the sky in one night. So I know we've talked about doing a virtual star party Messier marathon because that'd be kind of fun. I've never done one. I stink. I've never done one either. Never so. done one either. Uh, one of these days. Should do. After yeah. we make our daubs, we'll have a Messier marathon. <laughs> I know. I know. So anyway, so you're out all night. And the thing about being out all night is when we we when we label something a summer constellation. That typically means that it's up in the sky in the early evening when most people tend to be out and about at night, mm -hmm. um, or you know. Yeah. So so um, so yeah. yeah. So if if uh, you can see Sagittarius in the northern hemisphere, it's summer. It mm -hmm. tends to be in the summertime, um, in the evening. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're up all night, if you're up at 3 a.m. You're gonna see the, the you know the constellations are moving the Earth's rotating the constellations move across the sky. You're gonna see start seeing the summer constellations in winter uh, in March, for example, which is I guess spring. Um, so you start to see constellations that you don't associate normally with the season that you're in because it's three o'clock in the morning and you really shouldn't be outside <laughs> unless you're an astronomer, of course. Um, I have a, I have a similar experience with that. So for his, it was uh, looks like it was. Um, the teapot Sagittarius in, in March. Um, I my first year of grad school, we were doing a lab. Um, it was a, it was kind of a disaster, but it was supposed to be <laughs> measuring the airy disk of our telescope uh, of our uh, 125 year old telescope. Anyway, uh, so we were observing and observing and observing and observing and observing. We finally stagger out of the little doghouse. Uh, where the telescope is housed at, at University of Virginia, um, the, the little telescope, and uh, it was, I want to say it was October, and yeah. it was September, October, so it was fall, it was still kind of warm, we stagger outside, and Orion is high in the sky. <laughs> Orion <laughs> is a winter constellation, because it's winter right now, you can go out in the evening, see Orion up in the sky, Orion was up in the sky, and there was just this moment of Wow, it's the wrong time to be awake. If Ryan's <laughs> up in October, what happened, right? You need to be in bed because <laughs> we have class tomorrow. Um, that that's life, and it was especially funny because uh, my friend Jake Simon, who's a theorist, was the first one to point that out. He, he was like, "Oh my God!" It's like, "Yes, Jake, sky does things." I love you, Jake. I'm sorry. I make fun of you. <laughs> Uh, Jeff points out for the Messier objects, there are 110 Messier objects from our latitude. We maybe get 108 theoretically. Never gotten more than 106 yourself. Still, 106. 
objects. Yeah, that's a lot. Why? Yeah. And a lot of them are faint. I mean, M1, Crab Nebula, pretty faint. So you really got to be uh, know what you're doing to, uh, yeah. to get all of them. And there's a particular order, I know, to get them in because you want to catch the ones they're about to set right. before they do set. So I just, right. yeah, heard but never. That would be a fun activity. Yeah, Tom also pointed yeah. out 110. 10, okay, 110. A uh, few more comments. Daniel Berenger uh, says, other fun facts, back to Pleiades. Uh, Pleiades equals Subaru. This is uh, yes, the, the Japanese know. theme for, for, and yes, of course, I talk about this all the time because I drive a Subaru. Pamela Gay drives a Subaru. It's, you know, you just have to drive a Subaru. It's the Constellation car. It's the Constellation car. Sadly, the car manufacturer has changed their logo so it no longer looks like this. I still think it looks kind of like the Star Cluster, but maybe that's because I'm used to knowing that. Hmm. Um, and then the uh, the now long defunct yeah. you know points out the now long defunct movie studio Orion had the constellation as their logo, That's as well. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, and you know going yeah. back to your story of Cassiopeia and Andromeda and all that, you know that there's been a few movies made of that whole story because it's a famous uh, Greek story, and you know you can watch the really bad '80s one, um, <laughs> Clash of the Titans, and then I know I think it was remade at least once, and there's probably more, but. Um, yeah, if you just want a, a cheesy evening of yeah Greek mythology and and weirdness and and constellations live um, on the screen, totally gonna <laughs> make watch it and watch it's this with for a laugh. It's fun. It's fun. Awesome. But yeah, it's a famous story. What is it? Clash of the Titans. Clash of the Titans. In the eighties. Okay. In the eighties, right. I don't remember, uh, but it's definitely well, unless it's late seventies, which would be even more fun. But I think it's eighties, um, and I All think right. it was remade. Gosh, at least once. So, right. anyway, so Google that one. There you uh, go. Watch your Constellation movies. <laughs> see, see one one other. But you had a nice um, not story, but a way of thinking of the Big Dipper. I know. See, there's lots of oh yeah stories you know associated with the Big Dipper and the Great Bear or some major and all that. Um, because again, it's such a prominent constellation, at least for the Northerners. Um, and you know, it's of course a bear in many stories, but also, but you. Just told me today it was uh, three warriors they oh. stalking a bear. Yeah. So um, again, this is uh, it, I don't know if it's in the handout you had. Because um, again, I heard this story from Ed Murphy at University of Virginia when I was learning the constellations from him, because I had to teach them the next week. <laughs> like a good. So maybe Murphy. that's one of the more. Um, there's many um, Native American. The Great Bear, so yeah, so, so the, the Great Bear story, um, oh, okay, so here we go, Ir it was an Iroquois legend. Uh, so they see a bear too, now we, the, the Greek version of the constellation has a bear with a long tail, which is not biologically accurate, but <laughs> the story I've heard is it was swung around on the tail, yeah, kind of stretched. thrown up there, so Ursa Major is the main constellation, Big Dipper is of course uh, an asterism within that. Um, and according to an Iroquois legend, the bear was pursued by three hunters. Um, and so the, instead of having a long tail, those three stars of the handle of the dip are actually the three hunters that are uh, pursuing the bear. Um, and I, I, I don't I think I remember one... Oh, it's kind of sad, actually. Uh, okay, so yeah, here we go. The chase begins um, when, when the first hunter strikes the bear with a, with a bow and arrow. The wound wasn't serious, so the bear keeps running. Running, running, running across the sky, uh, bleeding from this arrow wound. This, I guess, the depressing part. Um, oh, here we go. This is the yeah. So it's um, so so the bear's running around, running around, and it gets close to the horizon. Um, yeah, in autumn, it's really low in the northwestern sky, and uh, so because it's that low in the autumn, low in the sky, the blood trickling from the wound is what turns the leaves, this is the, you know, turns the leaves uh, mm -hmm. colors in autumn. So this is, this is, this is one, one legend, one uh, yeah, uh, yeah. story of the, the hunters, the bleeding bear, and autumn. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I guess because the bear survives, it's not that sad, but it still kind of makes me sad that it's spinning around the sky. Oh, again, it's a circumpolar constellation, so depending on your latitude, it's, you know, it'll come back. Or it'll come back. Maybe never set if you're way up north. Right, right. Mm. I think, <laughs> yeah, it, it gets very low, but it doesn't quite set for us here. Um, no, no. Um, but, yeah, in the winter, it's pretty pretty hard to see. Yeah. Again, now, depending on what time you're out. <laughs> if you want to explore... Oh, okay. Uh, there's a okay. Maybe you'll get this. Sorry, 
comments again. Jeff Setzer, <laughs> Harry Hamlin is Perseus. The best character is the mechanical owl. This is about Clash of the Titans. Oh, yes, there was a mechanical owl. I <laughs> forgot about that. So you got to watch it for that. Okay. Oh, and we have a link from... Uh, Ancient from Greeks and robots together. So. And robots, because, you know, robots. <laughs> uh, the ultimate Messier object log with, the, with an acronym TUMOL is a great list to work from. So davidpaulgreen.com slash TUMOL. So uh, Tom Nathy posted that in the q and I will copy that onto the event page oh, cool. comments because reasons. Um, oh, and Guido has also seen Clash of the Titans. <laughs> Ray Harryhausen special effects. Cheesy as heck, but oh so fun. <laughs> but not an Orion production. So there you go. Oh well, yes. That's your homework, people. Go watch that movie. Um, if you, uh, great way to look at the sky. You can get a star. Do you, can you show your star wheel? Do you have your star wheel there? You can get your hands on a planisphere or star wheel. Uh, that's kind of the old school way of looking. I at don't know. Where I'm sure. Okay. So Did I steal great. it? Oh, there it is. Sky yeah, Challenger. Lots of great, um, this comes with six, I, I don't know where to get this. I'm sure you can get this somewhere online. What do you think? I'm sure you can. Um, it comes with like six different six different wheels. Um, so there's different ways to look at the sky. Of course, find the constellations. There's different little activities. Um, gosh, I got this so long ago. Um, but I'm sure it's probably still around. Wow, copyright 1978. Okay, that's pretty old. If you can't get that one in particular, I mean, if you Google but the I, it's so cool. I hope, I hope it's still around because it's really nifty. Probably massively updated and even better. Um, it's called Sky Challenger, and there's many versions of these sky wheels around. I need to find. And, um, Keep going. I'm, I just thought of something mm -hmm. I need to show people. <laughs> um, yeah. So that one. Uh, yeah, so if you don't have that one in particular, if you Google Planisphere, there are lots of ones you can just print and cut, and, and, and that's a really good activity to... Um, it's a good take-home activity with kids, is you can cut up these uh, star wheels and have kids make them. Yeah. I want to find the one I just got at AAS, because it makes me so happy, and this is thanks to Rob Minchin at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. Oh gosh, I can't find it. Um, the, he came up with a planisphere of the radio sky. Oh, okay. Which makes me so happy. I'm, oh, you here's, have one with the exoplanets also? Oh, I have, yeah, I'll show that one too. Um, oh. So, so I, I haven't made this one yet, uh, but it is the, this is the sky and the radio. So this is dominated, uh, I guess it depends on what frequency you're looking at. This is dominated by the Milky Way. It's dominated by the band of the Milky Way. And all of these bright, Circles, uh, I suspect. Oh no, those are actually the, those are actually the stars. So you can uh, imagine where the constellations. The uh, you can put it up against the sky and use these as the constellations. So there's the Big Dipper there, um, and actually imagine what you could see if you had radio eyes. Which I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, they had copies of this AAS. Uh, they will be putting it online. I'm sure we will tweet and retweet it. Uh, so thanks to Rob Minchin for yeah. giving me, letting me have a copy of that, even though it was technically for the kids. <laughs> Whoops. Hey. Um, and then the other plan is, uh, yeah, this is Planisphere Sky Chart. Um, this, there is a set from the Night Sky Network. So we've had uh, those folks on the show before. Um, if you go to just Google Night Sky Network, it'll take you to uh, great resources for amateur astronomers or anybody who wants to do astronomy outreach. Um, and they sent me, because I registered our little group here, <laughs> um, some of the Planet Quest materials. Planet Quest is about exoplanets, and they have these star charts, and these will fit into a, you can cut it out and fit it into a planisphere, you can leave it as is. This star chart um, yeah. that specifically points out vis visible or nearly visible, I think visible stars, or nearly visible stars, um, with little circles and numbers, and they're described down here. All of the planet, all of the stars that you can see in the night sky that have exoplanets. So this is really cool because you can tie in your night sky tour with um, with current astronomical science that's going on with all these exoplanet discoveries. And they have it for every month uh, for the northern hemisphere, I think. Yeah. They have no, actually, it's quite it's it's kind of northern south. 
I don't know. Oh, here we go. It's for uh, 35 north latitude. That's why I'm, I'm not really recognizing. Um, so yeah, so this is, so go to Night Sky Network and um, okay. versus look at Planet Quest and uh, I'll try and dig up that link because I'm pretty sure you can just print these, um, those, those star charts because uh, that's a really cool thing to have. That's great. I'm going to see if there are any last comments that I missed. And there had been hello and what's up. Hi. Hello. Hi, hi. Okay, I think I got, I may, I, I'm sorry if I missed anything, but I think at least there's none on YouTube that I can see. Um, so, anyway, I think I've got all the comments. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, uh, yeah, that is our show pretty much, unless you have any last minute stuff to add on. I will, uh, on the Google Plus event page, I will try and find the Night Sky Network link. Um, and add that on <clears throat> so you can check out the exoplanet um, sky maps because I really yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, maybe we can have a future show about the Messier Marathon and fill in the someone, telescope. And <laughs> someone who has successfully done a Messier Marathon <laughs> and or build the telescope, email me. <laughs> yeah, we Which don't actually likely. I don't know. Which would be like <laughs> I think this would be awesome. Um, yeah, so we actually are working on our schedule right now. If you know of anyone doing cool stuff in science or astronomy or any science, education and outreach, uh, or if you yourself have a cool project you want to talk about, uh, please email us at educate at cosmoquest.org, uh, or I'm sure you can just find one of us somewhere on the interwebs and <laughs> let us know, uh, or tweet at cosmoquestx. Um, let us know you'd like to be on the show, and we will schedule you on to talk about uh, fun, awesome stuff. Uh, as far as our usual weekly schedule go, the Weekly Space Hangout is on Friday at noon Pacific. Uh, I will actually try and rejoin this time. I tried to join last week, but I fell asleep because <laughs> I didn't sleep much at the oh, wow. Astronomical Society reading. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I'll bring some stories uh, to that. So if you get your space news from the Week of Space Hangout, virtual star party on Sunday night. I think it's still going on at 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, that is uh, a tour through the night sky, through the telescopes of our amazing astronomers uh, that... Uh, Scott Lewis and Fraser Kane have rounded up to show you the night sky, and you never have to leave your house, so super lazy time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can get to all those from the CosmoQuest uh, Plus Google Plus page, so plus.google.com slash CosmoQuest, or plus CosmoQuest. Virtual Star Party has its own page, too. Check that out. Astronomy Cast has its own page. They do that uh, noon on Monday, and then we roll back around to Learning Space, and we'll have a fun educational topic for you next week. Like I said, if you have a guest in mind that you want to try out, we're going to contact a whole bunch of people that we know are doing cool stuff and, and uh, get them to come talk about their cool stuff. So right. that's my rambly ending. Oh, you do that well. You do that very well. Awesome. Yes, I try because I don't want I don't want Richard to, to yell at me for <laughs> making bad audio. I love you, Richard. <laughs> All right. So that is yeah. it for this week's edition of the Thank you so much, guys. Oh, get out there and find a constellation. Woo. Or make one up. Make up a story. Yeah. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. Thanks. <laughs>